So, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the third day of the conference. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to be moderator of today's uh, first panel on the joint measures of, uh, to foster circular migration and uh, return migration. My name is Daniel Göhler. I'm professor for uh, geographic migration and transition studies at the University of Bamberg in Germany. I'm doing research on economic, social, and uh, urban geographies of Eastern and Southeastern Europe with a special focus on Russian Federation and uh, the Western Balkan countries. Migration is one of my main fields of interest uh, there. Let me explain uh, the panel's agenda for today. Uh, firstly, I will um, briefly introduce the topic and the panelists. Then we will have a first round with statements from the panel. Um, of approximately five minutes maximum, followed by comments by the audience and again reactions from the panel. This will be flanked by an instant online survey. Um, the results of this survey will serve as the basis for a third last round of discussion. Everything in 90 minutes, uh, which will be very, very challenging for all of us. Um, for introduction, I would like uh, the colleagues to uh, start with a video which is prepared by Deutsche Welle. Please. This is something I brought from my apartment in Berlin because uh, in Serbia people differently prepare coffee than uh, I got used there. So this is basically part of my ritual every day and also it reminds me of a very good time in Berlin. To me, it always seemed pretty unfair to just sit in my apartment and watch news uh, on, on the computer and not being uh, actually part of the, of the everyday work and trying to, you know, do my best as a journalist in this country to try to change things and actually to just maybe simply ask questions I was interested in back then in Berlin sitting in front of the computer. So that's the main reason why I decided to, to come back and to work here as a journalist, even though I know this is not the, the safest and the best job you can have at this moment in, in this country. I don't see right now that things can change that rapidly in order to, uh, for me to stay. But what I'm hoping to, to see is that kind of uh, to be a part of the change, you know, to be here, to try to be present in this country when change comes. Because I think that's what every journalist is uh, striving for, you know, to be part of the change and to be at the right place at the right moment. So, from a scientific perspective, this video reminds me strongly on elements uh, of the so-called migration development nexus or the migration knowledge uh, nexus. This concept describes when deficits of emigration, the brain drain, uh, turns into benefits by gaining positive effects by return, mainly in economic terms, but uh, it includes also effects on politics, uh, on governance, on civil society, on culture, or maybe <clears throat> uh, on some kind of uh, idealism. Uh, Philip said, I want to be part of the change, that's why I returned to Serbia. 
Generally, there are two interpretations of this concept. Uh, in an opti optimistic view, emigrants maintain often strong connections to the countries of origin, to the regions they left, and give support by remittances. Uh, so optimism is um, in the long run uh, connected to the expectation that migrants will come back sooner or later. In the pessimistic view, uh, we have to take into account lots of constraints for returnees on the labor market. We heard about, uh, about that uh, yesterday, in wage gaps, uh, in education, uh, in the social system. Nothing to say about the dependency, the possibly dependency of families on remittances. The question arising is more or less the question for the whole conference, how to turn these constraints into uh, potentials. That's the reason why we invited five distinguished experts uh, on that topic. Let me briefly introduce Monica Roman. Uh, she is full professor at the Department of Statistics and Econometrics at Bucharest University of Economics. Since 2011, she is uh, affiliated as research fellow at the Institute of Labor Economics in Bonn and at the Central European Labor Studies Institute in Bratislava. Jelena Bretojevic Stespic is PhD and research associate at the Institute of Social Science at Belgrade University. Her expertise includes the link between migration issues, demography, labor market, and human capital. Her current research focus, uh, among others, on migration and transnational entrepreneurship. Alida Vracic holds a Master of Science in international public policy from the University College of London. She is co-founder and the executive directress of Populari, a Bosnia-based think tank specialized in the European integration of the Western Balkans regions. Currently, she is Europe's future fellow at the Institute for Human Science in Vienna and uh, a visiting fellow at the European Council of Foreign, on Foreign Relations. Samir Beharic is well known from uh, Wednesday uh, afternoon session. He is member of the board uh, of the Western Balkans Alumni Association and he recently graduated at the University of Vienna and Leipzig University. He conducted his uh, master's thesis uh, research on the influence of foreign scholarship programs on brain, drain, uh, brain circulation. Birgit Glorius, last but not least, is a full professor for human geography with a special focus on European migration at the Technical University of Chemnitz. Her research interests um, and the majority of publications are in the fields uh, of international migration, demographic change, uh, geographies of education. She has research experience in Eastern Germany, Poland, Bulgaria and um, the Western Balkan countries. So let me open uh, the first round uh, on the panel with a question to Birgit. Uh, Birgit, you analyzed circular migration of students between Eastern and Western Europe with a special focus on knowledge transfer and the question of the knowledge development nexus. Recently, you finalized a research project on return migration of Bulgarian students who graduated abroad. Please um, give us a short insight into the results of this study, and uh, maybe you can draw some conclusions from that study, which was done in a uh, European Union country for the Western Balkan countries. Please. Yeah, thanks, Daniel, and good morning to everybody. Uh, I will briefly um, talk about this Finnish project where we were interested in uh, migration biographies of uh, young Bulgarians who decided to study abroad. Uh, most of them uh, who we did interviews with uh, studied in Germany, but there were also people who went to UK, to Norway, or to the United States. And we were interested um, how those young people take the decision to either stay in the country of emigration after graduation and enter the labor market there, given that they already are very well socialized with those um, host countries, or if they take the decision to return to their country of origin um, in the context of wage differences between Bulgaria and Western European countries, uh, this would be um, a step against economic rationality, um, if, you, if you look at it from uh, migration theory. So you would always estimate that people rather stay abroad. Uh, how did we do this research? We selected um, 30 uh, interviewees um, in Bulgaria who returned and 30 persons in Germany who um, 
graduated there a while ago and uh, were well, had taken the decision to stay in Germany. Um, it was a qualitative research. We did uh, biographical interviews um, as we assumed that um, those young people's migration decisions are very much connected with uh, life stage decisions. Um, just very briefly, a couple of findings, and I will concentrate on uh, the returnees um, whom we interviewed. Um, so what were the ma main reasons to return? Um, some of them just returned because they, they had plans to return after graduation, but in fact, it was not that um, easy to, to determine this because uh, often it was more complex um, uh, why they returned. Um, social life was a strong reason to return, so the, the, the wish to reunite with families, with friends, to enjoy the, the climate, uh, the food of the home country, and so on. Um, they did not return for economic goals, but I would say there was a part of returnees who said they uh, returned because they thought it would be good for their career development. And there was one interviewer who, who said, well, I have the impression uh, the people who return are those who want to grow. Um, so really anticipating that uh, the situation in the country of return is not easy, it's, it's a challenge, but as we just saw in this little video, um, really the motive to, 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 to make something beneficial for the country, to bring back knowledge to the country, um, and at the same time to grow, because you might, might have in this transition um, situation, um, you might have uh, better opportunities uh, to develop something on your own than in Germany or in another Western European country where everything is well settled already. Um, so what does this mean for the migration development nexus? I will draw three very short conclusions. Um, we saw that a beneficial return needs preparation. So people who just return spontaneously um, experienced some yeah, struggles and also um, had some learning time until they really were um, satisfied with their labor market integration and career. And they reflected on that and, and, and said, well, it would have been better to prepare. Um, how can you prepare? How did they prepare those who did? Um, they prepared um, mostly by engaging in transnational networks of people who did the same like of former returnees who shared their experiences. Um, interestingly, we did not find any connection to state programs like return programs by the Bulgarian state or support programs. It was all done by uh, returnees in terms of um, NGO work or institutionalized networks. Um, regarding those networks, we found that also those who are, who are staying abroad uh, can contribute uh, to the home country because they engage in those networks, and uh, especially those who were self-employed, really found um, opportunities to do business uh, interactions with Bulgaria, especially in the new um, social media market. Um, and the third conclusion was um, regarding the reflections of the stayers in comparison with the returnees, that um, there's a mismatch between the real realities in the country of return and the opportunities we have there and um, the expectations of people, meaning that stayers um, mostly saw much bigger obstacles regarding a return than was reflected by returnees. And that's a point where I think um, state programs or any kind of support institutions could step in and just give more transparency about the realities at, at home, uh, about opportunities and can really facilitate uh, the way back and uh, the way how to become beneficial for the country of return. Thank you. Thank you for your input and keeping the time perfectly. Thank you. So uh, let's ask uh, or include Monica Roman. Uh, Monica, you are a team leader in the project Empowerment through Liquid in Integration of Migrant Youth in Vulnerable Conditions. Uh, I know liquid, uh, the concept of liquid migration, but not the concept of liquid integration. So please explain that. Um, and uh, maybe is it a new approach to foster return of circular migration? Monica, please. Thank you. So uh, our project um, 
empowerment or liquid integration of migrant youth in vulnerable conditions is one of the many projects financed by the European Union and devoted to analyzing the path and the practices, best practices that would lead to empowering young in vulnerable conditions in their integration process. Actually, this was my second project of this kind in which I'm involved in. And uh, for now, the project just started in 2020 and we are able to report some very initial results using macro statistical data. But before going into results, I would like to um, suggest a bit or to answer uh, Professor Gerer's questions related to the concepts. Basically, migration, as we all know, is extremely diverse recently, and young migrants are the ones facing various types of migrations in uh, regarding the uh, length of migration and the type of the process. So uh, liquid migration, as you already mentioned, was introduced in 2012 by Engerson. And um, the concept is very much related to various migration types. Migration is no longer regarded as being linear or only circular, but it may be also be in various shapes. So people are oscillating between geographical locations. They migrate in, in circles to one place, from one place to another place, and from there to a third place. And then they may return to uh, to their home country. So uh, having this diversity of migration, circular migration may, may now be regarded as uh, one particular form of these new uh, shapes migration may take. In this context, of course, integration may be or should be also looked at um, in a more larger uh, sense. And the concept of liquid integration actually tries to focus on the complexity of migration process. So individuals should respond and should adjust to the constant transformation of, of various institutions they meet in various countries. And uh, this adjustment process may also affect the integration. So both at individual and structural level, uh, integration process must be understood as being non-linear and unpredictable. In this context, young individuals, young migrants, uh, a fascinating topic widely discussed yesterday. So young migrants are the most vulnerable group as they are the most mobile group. Uh, so yeah, I hope I bring some clarification regarding the concepts that are used in, uh, in our MIMI project. And regarding the initial results, basically the methodology employed in the project is, uh, is mixed. We are starting with um, a macroeconomic analysis and uh, from a quantitative perspective, and in parallel, we are also conducting various uh, types of uh, interviews, focus group, and so on for better understanding how vulnerable migrants may be integrated within European Union countries. Initial results show that there is large room for better understanding young migrants, uh, not only by looking at the standard dimensions of integration, such as uh, labor markets integration or social inclusion, but also related to education. There still are significant gaps in terms of education participation or unemployment rates or labor market integrations between young natives and uh, young migrants, mostly when we are referring to migrants coming from uh, third countries. Okay, thank you, Monica. So let's go on thank with Jelena Pretujevic uh, dispatch. Um, Jelena, you addressed, among other topics in your research, trans, uh, transnationalism and uh, transnational entrepreneurship. Um, how far do you see transnationalism as a factor to stimulate uh, return, migration, return, migration, return migration of talents, especially young people? Please. 
Uh, thank you, Professor Geller. Uh, first, I will take this opportunity to thank our hosts for organizing this important conference to better understand the Western Balkans uh, complex migration processes and to give our countries additional encouragement to developing effective policy measures to mitigate immigration processes. Permanent residence in destination countries is still the dominant form of immigration. However, a significant increase in the transnational migrant activities is also noticeable. This is also the case with the migrants from, from the Western Balkans and especially in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, one of the main reasons for the growth uh, is that they are additionally driven by the dynamics of globalization. So they uh, give room to various uh, kind of uh, uh, initiatives. Transnational economic practices can vary also greatly in the scope and in, in intensity. They involve a wide range of migrants from low skill to high skill, professionals, entrepreneurs, and both in a formal and in informal economy. It implies different ways of embeddedness, both in the society of destination and origin, uh, a wide range of processes of adaptation and coping with different social contexts. Thus, uh, uh, mm, uh, transnationalism mm, can influence immigrant integration and uh, it also uh, opens up a new possibility for more efficient ways of connecting um, uh, diaspora with countries of, of origin. Overall, the rapid globalization, international, uh, 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 international businesses, and fast ascending immigration processes promise an upward trend in transnational economic activities and in entrepreneurship. However, we lack comprehensive knowledge on this phenomenon. Therefore, uh, both uh, theoretical and empirical research is required to clearly and thoroughly unveil the different aspects of international activities and their governance, of course. In this sense, I would like to refer shortly to the results uh, of the research on transnational entrepreneurs in Serbia and Albania I was uh, uh, engaged in. And this is one of very few studies on transnationalism uh, in the Western Balkans. Transnational entrepreneurs are reality in the Western Balkans, but Till recently, they were unrecognized in the policy scope. Uh, as migrant group, they have potential to boost circular migration and create new development options in origin countries through expanding their business operation. Uh, this especially stands for opportunity entrepreneurs, but also for necessity entrepreneurs with their micro businesses. Uh, they are uniquely positioned between home and destination country and are successful because they are transnational. Also, they carry potential for strengthening cooperation in the Western Balkans and interregional migration. And through their ventures, partly they can compensate skill shortages in the region. It is important to say that uh, they simultaneously function as a part of different networks, which help them in overcoming challenging, but also pursuing opportunities. Therefore, we need to gain more, gain more knowledge on the dynamics of their social capitals, the challenges they face and help their business become faster integrated into economies, especially of the re, uh, origin countries. On the other hand, Public policy decision making should be more proactive and dynamic, which unfortunately is not the case in many domains. Uh, it is needed to develop innovative approaches uh, to e uh, efficiently manage these uh, alternative migration pa pa patterns uh, that can bring uh, development. And as a conclusion, I would like to underline that only countries that invest significantly in the quality of system of education and Western Balkans countries are of those kinds, especially of higher education and of technical staff could benefit uh, from this uh, type of uh, technology transfer. So for now, that's it. Thank you. 
Thank you, <coughs> Jelena. Um, and we go on with uh, Alida Vracic. Alida, you represent the perspective of political science in our panel. How far is uh, European integration a precondition, a prerequisite for return, or will it, vice versa, stimulate more immigration? Alida, please. Yes. <clears throat> Can you hear me well? Can you hear me well? Yes, perfect. Okay, excellent. Now, many thanks for this um, panel and many thanks for this conference. Um, I have to be honest, if I envisaged this five years ago, it wouldn't be possible. At the time I started my research on immigration and circular migration because there, was, there seemed to be no interest uh, in the region, but also in the EU capitals to discuss this sort of thing. Five years on, we're here and we have a three-day conference discussing immigration, circular migration, and, and future prospects. So that makes me very happy. Um, as for the EU integration, I think we should have no illusions that uh, EU integration will, is, is a quick fix for anything. Uh, at, at its core, the EU uh, is about mobility. So probably we should also observe it that way. People should move around, people emigrate, and this is perfectly normal. Uh, if you actually put together all people that are living outside of their residence in the EU, you would have the largest country in the EU of people that are commuting in between, working and operating perfectly well. Now, in the light of what is happening at the moment with COVID-19, I think this is even more important because, as you know, companies are deciding to actually promote uh, work from home or, or remote work. There are more and more possibilities with digital infrastructure. So I think this is a changing moment. This is a really good moment to discuss these, all these issues. Uh, as we have seen in, in cases of Croatia, Romania, Bulgaria, EU doesn't necessarily stop immigration. On contrary, it might even you know, accelerate the immigration. We have in Croatia that I have followed closely, thousands of people leaving from 2013 on, doctors, engineers, but also all other people. That means basically that, you know, we shouldn't put all our uh, uh, um, coins into one bucket. And at the same time, there is this great incentive of the EU, which is the convergence. We need to have promote convergence so people actually feel better at home, not being forced to leave, at least for not for the economic reasons if we, if we wave out the, the rest of it. And this economic convergence simply never happened. It never took place. When we talk about convergence, I'm talking about equal standards or closer to equal standards uh, uh, to the EU um, capitals at the moment, so 20 plus countries. Um, at the same time, EU is very much invested into the region uh, in, in, this, in, in the political sense, but also economical sense. And if you look at the trade, if you look at the ratio uh, between the uh, Western Balkans in this concrete sense, but also Southeast Europe and the EU capitals, this is the primary market. And these jobs and the, these uh, sort of exchanges uh, of mobility should, should, should come as really natural. So I think there is a great role that uh, EU can play at this moment, promoting circular migration. And having said that, I don't think we, we really have to invent that much. I mean, there's hundreds of examples around. I've, I personally have investigated Irish model, but there are other models that we can look upon where they have basically created an environment where people want to return to some extent, but not only Irish people want to return, but there, there are other people who would like to come to Ireland because of all sorts of incentives that are, that are being created. And we're coming to the bottom line that, that, that people will want to live in a country that basically provides, you know, where they have, and this is something that has been discussed yesterday, where they have clean air, where they have prospects of jobs, where they have good schools, where they have a uh, quality uh, uh, health system. All these things are part of the, the, the larger sort of EU reform. And this is exactly the convergence point that I'm referring to. At the same time, um, there are things that we can do as, as of today, because there are hundreds of initiatives being launched already in the 90s that are still existing, where we can basically plug in and try to, to sort of use the networks and try to use these platforms to connect people. There is also a, a, a necessity to harmonize certain things that are on the EU level or actually in the Western Balkans, but, but being promoted by the EU. And I'm specific, specifically here referring to the Eurostat, 
I mean, yesterday we talked a little bit and with my colleague, Tim Judah, I've done some work on it. Data doesn't really, doesn't really help because it, it's all over the place. It's scattered. It's not reliable. So why not putting this in one place? Why not having Eurostat harmonizing methodologies and harmonizing data in a way that we actually can use it as, as, as a future policy making tool? So, uh, and then we can go on and on and on. I recently have done some work for the um, IWM here in Vienna on health workers. This is super important. If you watch the news today, you will see that there is a shortage of doctors and nurses, medical staff in general. This is exactly the point where the EU can basically uh, plug into, into the system and help ease in a way the situation back in the Balkans if there is a shortage. Because as we know, in March and April, countries of the EU basically flown in uh, uh, nurses and doctors uh, from Bulgaria, Romania and other places in order to be safe uh, uh, when, with, with their own medical sectors. Exchange programs, we have talked about education. This is all under EU umbrella. So at its core, being about mobility, being about economic reforms, being about convergence, I think there is a huge role that EU can play uh, in, in this respect. At the same time, of course, there is a portion of work that has to happen back in the region. And it would take probably two days to discuss that particular segment because I don't think we have done enough. I don't think some countries even uh, started or begun talking about immigration, circular migration in a proper way, but they kind of scratching on the surface still and, and trying to figure out what are, what are the possible models. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those most important things that I, I personally uh, think happening in the region and that, that they should be discussing because there are no partners for reforms of the EU uh, if you have no people that are educated and, 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 and capable of understanding what, what, what kind of tasks are actually before us. Uh, in that sense, EU will not have really partners to work with um, if everyone is gone at one point. And one last thing, um, we, we, we kind of lightly use this brain drain uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, expression. Uh, more I work on it, more I realize it's wrong actually. And why I say it's wrong, it's because there is a pressure being created back in the region that those who do not emigrate are actually those you know, who had no brain to, to, do, it, to do it. So it's really, it, it, we shouldn't use it as lightly. It's, it's an immigration of people, but you know, we shouldn't be put even more pressure onto those that are staying in the region. So we should be somewhat more careful about how we use it. Um, and we should anyway, not discuss this in an emotional manner because there's so many benefits uh, immigration brings, especially for the small countries. A country of three or four or five million people can only benefit really from immigration. Last point I want to make, and this is me opening up a new sort of topic that we might discuss or here or not. Countries that are prosperous and countries that um, are, are well off in, in economic sense, but also other culture and other senses are countries that experience immigration. This is one thing that simply has not come to the agenda whatsoever in the region, at least in the Western Balkans. At the, mo at the moment, this is super emotional uh, uh, question that is being often portrayed as a difficult one. Uh, but in reality, life is happening. At, at, you have in the region now kids that are first, second, third grade that are speaking probably better Serbian, Bosnian, Croatian than Arabic. This is life. And this is happening. And I think we should be discussing it also in, the, in, the, in an informed way and in the, in the sort of a, a policy oriented way, but we should definitely start off uh, discussing this particular issue. So I'm going to end up here. Yes, thank you, Olida. Um, I think we should do so. Thank you for uh, widening the perspective <clears throat> um, to the uh, European Union dimension. So uh, lastly, I would ask uh, Samir Beharic, or include Samir. Um, Samir, you did your master thesis more or less on your own CV, uh, when I understood it right, by, when analyzing the influence of foreign scholarship programs on brain circulation especially. Does foreign scholarship contribute to intensify brain drain or will it stabilize brain circulation? Samir, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gola, and thank you very much to, uh, um, to everyone who spoke before me. I really enjoyed uh, well, when we speak about 
the Western Balkans and Bosnia and Herzegovina in general. Like I live in a country where where an individual is considered successful if he or she leaves. And this is also something that is somewhere in people's mindset. And we continuously um, we continuously discuss about brain drain without mentioning brain circulation or, or, or brain retention, brain gain. And in this uh, public sphere, there are not enough, I would say, um, discussions, uh, not just research. We, I, I think we should bring the research back into the media, um, into the general discussions with young people, uh, with their parents especially, uh, because um, it, it, is, it is our generation, my mom's generation, my parents' generation, um, who thinks um, there is no future here for young people in the Western Balkans and something should, should change. And that's why also people are pushed uh, in a way to leave the country and um, in a way um, there is this pressure, uh, this push factor from, from, from here and a lot of really um, um, strong pull factors from the EU in this particular case or from the Western Hemisphere. Um, during my during my MA thesis, I really did a this um, research about um, young people who currently study abroad. Um, those are um, either exchange students or full degree students uh, studying in the EU as scholarship holders of different uh, EU programs. I myself um, have during my BA degree, I had spent um, three exchange programs um, abroad as a scholarship holder, holder of Erasmus Plus program. Turkish government and my master's studies was um, completed at two universities in the EU as a scholarship holder of, uh, of Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, um, Germany's uh, political foundation. And what I have concluded there from the, from the discussions with my peers is there are three groups of people. Uh, one group of people, um, which is a, from my qualitative research is, was the smallest one. Those are those who do not want to return in, in back to Bosnia, for example. And to be honest, this is something that surprised me in a bit because I didn't think this will be the smallest percentage of those people. Um, they said they are they are fine abroad. They have they have um, met a lot of people there. They like the values abroad. They do not like the values at home here. Um, and they said they do not want to return. Second group of people, which is a bit bigger, are those, for example, uh, who would like to come back, but they do not see the resources back home that could utilize their skills and knowledge. So for example, I discussed with PhD students um, of genetics in Norway and in Italy. They said, we would love to come back home. We love our home. We didn't come here to study because we don't like um, staying home in Bosnia and Herzegovina or in the Western Balkans. However, we do not see uh, what we could do with our skills, with our PhDs back home because simply there are no resources there are no um, institutions uh, that would be able to utilize our knowledge. So this goes back to institutions when you speak about circular migration and will foreign scholarship boost circular migration? Yes, it will if uh, the local government of the region enable those young people uh, to come back and to utilize their skills. And the biggest group uh, of people, they said they want to come back uh, because those are the people who went abroad with a strong motivation to gather the skills, uh, to bring the skills back to the country and to use them here. The problem is um, on what we have seen so far on the people who have returned after studying abroad, that they are in a lot of cases, not just neglected, but that they are at least well embedded into the system who work against them, not to come to a place in, in a position of power that will enable them to endanger those elites who have well established roots um, and um, uh, power relations within, within the system. Um, and I would say here, when we speak about um, scholarships and brain circulation, and when we discuss this with politicians, which is every time for me, um, highly, highly um, disappointing. They say, Yo, you, you know, like it, it's everywhere. This happens everywhere. Um, migration of people, you know, people leave everywhere from Spain, from Italy, that's only partly true. Uh, people who leave from Italy and from Spain are usually replaced by other groups of migrants, of immigrants into those countries uh, in Eastern Europe as well. However, we do not have this group who replaces our migrants, our doctors, our nurses, um, our highly educated young people that our countries invest in. Uh, if we combine 
uh, if we combine all the costs of youth migration uh, from the Western Balkans, yearly cost of youth migration goes to 6.5 billion uh, euros. This is the data by the uh, Belgrade-based Institute for uh, Development and Innovation. Um, and what we need here um, is a bigger sample. And I will conclude with this. Uh, I'm also a board member of the Western Balkans Alumni Association, which is the only regional um, association organization that gathers young people who have studied abroad as um, recipients of foreign scholarship programs and decided either to return or to stay abroad. So what we will be doing in the next couple of months, um, we will be launching a um, Western Balkans Alumni Association tracer study. This tracer study will be directed as, at current and former recipients of scholarships provided by the European Commission. And we want to see where are those people? What do they do? What are their connections? What are their plans? Do they plan to stay abroad, to come back? If they stay, if they plan to stay abroad, we want to see what are their intentions. Do they want to uh, continue communicating with their homeland and with their home country? And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, young people from the Western Balkans will join the EU with or without the region. My brother has just got his Swedish citizenship two days ago. He will never come back to Bosnia and Herzegovina. He will come back only to my mom's place. I'm currently in Yaita, in my hometown, as a tourist. And I think this is something that we need somehow, maybe not prevent, but to utilize in a way for our own uh, benefit here in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank all five panelists for the statements. Um, so I'd like to open the floor for the audience. Before we do so, um, I'd like to start with the instant survey for the audience. Uh, the first question is uh, regarding the given situation in the Western Balkan countries. Uh, is return a realistic prospect for young people? You may vote with yes or no quite easy question. So um, I will hand over to the co-moderator, Christian Hagemann, just to collect uh, and moderate the Q&A session, please. Yeah, thank you very much. And good morning also from me. We have a couple of comments and questions from the audience and also one raised hand. I will start with the written statements. And um, there's one uh, question I will read out, which is, uh, very interesting and mainly directed to Birgit Glorius. Um, it says, we've heard a lot about how the situation with regard to migration and demography can be turned around in the Balkans with good governance, better standards of living and EU integration, but the experience of Eastern Germany suggests this is not true at all. Since this is a German conference, I'd be interested to hear what the Germans here have to say about what can be learned from your own experience. So um, this is one question. Then. There's more of a comment which says uh, people should profit from best practice examples. Space and opportunity should be offered to returnees in their home countries, places to meet and to keep their foreign languages. And um, the, uh, the comment refers to the Spanish example of an organization called um, Apoya was founded to help young returnees finding their place at home again and not losing contact to home as well as to the foreign country. And um, another question goes, uh, in, the in the medical sector, aren't it often also working conditions in the Western Balkan countries which stimulate migration? Why do the governments in the region uh, don't do more to improve these working conditions and in particular fight corruption and create better career opportunities? This is their responsibility in the first place, isn't it? So we have no... Um, no people from uh, governments here, but uh, probably you can also comment on this one. And um, finally, I see one raised hand, and um, this is by Antje Müller, and we can add her directly to, to give her comment or question. Can you hear us, Antje? Good morning, everyone. I can hear you very well, but the question is if you can hear me, if you just can give me a short Thumbs yes, up perfectly. or down. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your very nice and interesting inputs. Uh, I am convinced that we could have a much longer conference uh, talking and discussing every single bit uh, you have mentioned. Um, however, I would like to uh, come back to something which has been stated by uh, Mrs. Glorious right in the beginning, that beneficial return needs to be prepared. Um, which I completely agree. 
I would like to give you a very short exam example. So what um, I'm responsible for the Zoran Zinic internship program of German business. And what we do is uh, that we give uh, young professionals the opportunity to gain work experiences in Germany in the frame of internships in order to close their gap between theoretical knowledge and hands-on experiences, which is very often missed in order to increase their employability back in the region. So um, our, pro our program aims at supporting the employability in the region. However, what I or what we have been seen is that um, the preparation to return back to the region is a very large one and it is a very important one. So we have a very large and very active alumni network, which is on a regional basis. And we include our alumni before our new scholarship holders leave to Germany, because we have seen that many young professionals don't even regard their own labor markets as an opportunity, as a possibility to work. Um, these, I mean, there are many reasons which have been discussed during the last couple of days, why people would like to leave or why people have the need or the pressure to leave. Um, so what I have been seeing is that there is a large lack of best practice examples which have been uh, publicly shown and which people are aware of. So our alumni prepare our scholarship holders right from the beginning and show them the opportunities in their own labor market and show them that having a decent education, having gained experiences also abroad, uh, using mobility, um, can and leads to a, a good integration back in the original labor market. Of course, and this is like a bracket, um, there are many frameworks which need to be fulfilled as well. Um, so to make a long story short, what, um, or maybe just to add something else before I would like to close my story is uh, um, what we also do, and this is something which is very important is uh, that we do offer many trainings and educational seminars uh, because the lifelong learning is something which at least we have the feeling is not very established in the region. And in order to stay on track with the, with the needs of the labor market, if you just uh, talk about the labor market, and uh, it needs to be constantly trained and further educated. So this is what we also do. And our alumni see the benefit of having this, uh, this combination. Um, so it's um, to make a long story short, I, I don't have a question. I just want to put this uh, on the on the agenda as well that there, there are many takeaways of this conference but for me one of the most important takeaways is that there is a lack of best practice examples in the region um, or, and there should be or this is a suggestion um, there should be a larger focus on peer-to-peer -peer education when it comes to best practice examples I think it is specifically when it comes to young professionals, it is important that young professionals speak themselves about their best practice examples and, uh, and not parents or teachers or professors or politicians. Thank you very much. Definitely. Thank you, Antje, for sharing this with us. And uh, I might also point you to the videos we've gathered on our web portal, where also a lot of young people share their experiences and they are also uh, some of the scholarship holders from the Jinjit program included who, who talk about this experience. So um, before I give back to, uh, to our host, um, I would just uh, underline that you can still uh, send us your statements, your questions, and uh, you can also still answer the, the survey that's still going on, which I see not all people have, have answered yet. So thank you very much for now and back to Daniel Göhler. So thank you for the interesting um, questions, the, 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 the interesting comments. Um, just to, to summarize a little bit, uh, the first was uh, on or addressed directly on Birgit, um, which would be very interesting to hear something on the Eastern German case, uh, just to find uh, solutions for the Western Balkan countries. Second one was on the Spanish case. The third um, question is a very, very big topic, especially in these days of COVID-19, the medical sector and uh, um, the, the, the working conditions in the medical sector. 
uh, which is not that good in Germany, which is uh, very, very bad uh, in most of the Western Balkan countries. And one of the triggers of out-migration of the uh, migrants, uh, especially in the medical sector. And um, I think very, very important, the comment of uh, Antje Müller on um, good or best practice uh, examples, uh, just to make clear and to show the benefits uh, of such programs. Um, I think it's very, very uh, important for young people from Western Balkan countries to, um, to look at employability and internships, internships abroad, uh, not only in Germany, but as well as in the uh, in UK or somewhere else. It's a very, very important tool um, if we look at employability uh, of uh, young people. Um, just a comment from my side, um, we have lots of students groups um, who come to Bamberg for a couple of days or uh, weeks and the first thing I uh, include in the program is to visit uh, a company, uh, to visit a professional company in our region and to show how, uh, is, um, how, how see, is a workplace in Germany organized, how are the structures behind and so on. And I think that is uh, very, very important. But I'll give the floor to Birgit uh, for a comment uh, on the Eastern German perspective, please. Yeah, thanks uh, to all presenters and thanks to the interesting questions, uh, especially, of course, to this uh, question on the German-German example, uh, because this is, this is really a, an interesting showcase because now we have the only transition situation, I think, in Europe where uh, you have those large gaps uh, in, the, in the immediate transition um, situation, wage gaps, um, uh, gaps also in terms of um, living conditions or perceived living quality. Um, and on the other hand, you had very low barriers for immigration. You had no language barrier, you, had, you did not apply for a visa or anything. So this, of course, makes the situation totally different. Um, now we are in year 30 of re uh, unification and we now see that um, the uh, migration balance um, is balanced again. There are also there are even uh, some gains uh, in East German regions um, by um, um, yeah, return migration from West Germany, but we indeed had uh, many years of really uh, huge emigration, uh, notably in the first years of all people of uh, working age, and then for years and years uh, after that, especially young people uh, seeking for um, vocational education or seeking for employment or a, a um, career step. And what we saw in the region is, and I think this is really, uh, I think Samir uh, also touched this point, that there was a development and a, a high persistence of an emigration culture. Like really, we still have young people, like especially in small towns in East Germany, where we uh, like have research results on that, uh, who, who have still the perception that um, it's only beneficial to leave. Um, so those who don't manage to leave are the losers. And uh, this is something that is still uh, also um, transported by the, the parent generation. And um, referring to my Bulgarian project, we had um, uh, age, uh, different age cohorts of interviewees and um, we, we saw that this stage is uh, almost over. So that was like during the 1990s and early 2000s that parents, for example, uh, really pushed their children's, uh, children out. Uh, but we saw uh, in East Germany that there's really a high persistence of this culture, of this perception that you really need to go. Um, okay, so now we are in year 30. We see that people are returning. We see that especially smaller towns are um, in East Germany are trying to, to install support programs because they need qualified labor force and they are trying to raise their um, winning points. For example, um, is still a little bit cheaper living conditions, especially in terms of housing, um, uh, good conditions for childcare. And uh, indeed, um, we see um, it, it's the young family founda founda founding generation who is returning, like people who um, went away for the education or for the early career, married, are now in the stage of having children, and now look for opportunities to, to go back um, to install a family life back in East Germany, um, also like ha having the nearness to grandparents, of course. Um, so this is the story of East Germany, and uh, we, we can see that there are stages, stages of development in this immigration, but what is really interesting is that the perceptions 
are sometimes more stable than the reality. And we also have to work on the, on the perceptions. Thank you. Somehow our moderator left us, so maybe we just moderate ourselves. Maybe Alita could touch upon the case of medical workers from Germany, Hi, generally can, medical workers. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I'm the operator. Uh, so the Wi-Fi connection in Berlin just crashed. Mm -hmm. So we are so not online now either. We are online. But we're trying to get um, our hosts back online. Okay, I think we can we can manage ourselves because there are still those questions that need to be answered. All right, as soon as we're back, I'll get them. Uh, I'll get them online. Perfect. And we also have a we also have a eighty three people actually can hear us perfectly mm -hmm. well. So probably we should pursue this. Simon, mm -hmm. you mentioned the. Uh, Germany and health workers. I mean, this is this is one big issue that you know that I've been working on. Um, it's it's really medical staff in general, and this is not happening in the last year. This is happening continuously because there are different exchange programs uh, with uh, GIZ, but there are also schemes where you can pr practically, like in any country of the Western Balkans, um, go to the certain focal points and uh, start your process in order to become certified to work in in one of the one of the institutions back in i mean in, in germany be it an elderly home or a hospital or something else and there that it really is interesting because it sparked uh, lots of interest back in the region uh, now there is a good point about it and we have seen it elsewhere you know you if you have people that are motivated to become medical workers and to work in germany in reality certain percentage of them actually doesn't ever go so they stay as, as a stock of, you know, uh, uh, qualified workers back in the country. So it's not necessarily, it's, it's not per se at all bad. What I was arguing is that we should uh, have some sort of program and some, some countries recently have imposed uh, or not imposed, but suggested a certain establishment of certain uh, uh, um, funds, basically, uh, places where you can put money in order to, to engage uh, other doctors to, to operate in the region and go back and forth. And we have seen these examples. I know personally some people that can commute between the countries, so they basically earn money and they have their tax bases in one place, but they can also operate elsewhere. And this is what I've been, been sort of advocating, this portability of benefits, so they can decide where you want to do and what you want to do, because there is no way anyone can be prevented to leave if they really want to leave. It would be an illusion to think that you can stop anyone. I mean, if people are qualified, if they're young, if they're ambitious, there is no way, um, you know, any, any sort of policy will, will, will stop them. Uh, at the same time, as I said, it's really good to have, for smaller countries especially, it's really good to have the circulation because we ourselves are not in the frontier of technological advancements. We don't have access to all sorts of things that, things that exist out there. So having people coming back and, 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 and you know, one way or the other, infiltrating that knowledge makes all, all sense in the world. And the last thing, maybe the last point is, um, it goes back to not necessarily something that we have discussed here, but I think it's really important. The entire region calls for FDI, foreign direct investments, foreign direct investments. There is another category, which is DDI, the diaspora direct investments. That would make so much more sense actually for the region because that know-how is, is, it has more chances to stay within the region than if, you, if you're speaking about FDI only. This is something that policymakers haven't even scratched. And this is what requires strategies. And what I've seen in other experiences, this is really top down process. This is not you know, NGOs, universities, clever people gathering and, and basically uh, trying to, to sort of figure out how to do it. This is government deciding that this is an important issue and then they trickle it down and then they engage all the institutions from charities to the universities to education centers, whoever. This is how it works. And also one other thing um, that I can, we kind of overlook here, not all people that want to return are well off. There are many, many people that simply, you know, fail to, to sort of 
do anything back somewhere in Germany, somewhere in Austria, somewhere in, in, in Sweden, and they need to anchor themselves back. We hardly speak about those people. And, and this is where the state also should provide because there are many of those too. I mean, these stories are not necessarily being spelled out because we, we prefer hearing about successful people that have left. Many are you know, not in that position whatsoever. So there are different perspectives on, on, on the same kind of theme. I think we have a moderator back. So Daniel, we just kept on answering the questions. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's, that's good that you uh, made yourself uh, yeah. <clears throat> just just to solve the problems for your own. Uh, we have some serious technical problems in the studio, so uh, I just grabbed another laptop. So it's a, it's it's the third computer around me, uh, and I just uh, try to fix um, everything. So I missed now the last 10, 15 minutes of the discussion. Um, I think that the round is completed now. Uh, now you should give me a short update. Uh, Jelena, please. Just unmute myself. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to say some uh, just shortly about the, uh, the need for integration programs because it was mentioned a couple of times here. Uh, and reintegration of migrants uh, uh, after returning, but uh, even before the return to the country of or origin is one of the most important but most demanding processes. Uh, it involves not only adapting returnees, but also the local communities they uh, come in and uh, uh, return. However, it requires long-term support, uh, also strategic approach and significant resources, uh, resources because uh, um, and uh, available programs uh, that exist uh, usually cannot meet. And therefore, integration programs are uh, the very important part of the entire migration process. Also, the policy should include measures to reduce the costs and negative effects of migration. Having in mind the focus of uh, the, our session, about, among the most uh, significant uh, measures are those to minimize the family disruption caused by the circular migration. Uh, and the circular migration on Western Balkans uh, is reality. We must accept it, uh, uh, but it is invisible, invisible in statistics because it lasts less than t uh, 12 months and it, uh, in, it is uh, uh, made in informal economy, uh, majority of it. And uh, to make the most of the development benefits, countries of origin should also direct policy toward measures that integrate circular migration into development programs. And effective problem solving requires uh, expanding the migration and related issues to wider plans. It uh, would be very important that development agency at the uh, EU, the origin and destination countries through joint efforts integrate migration to their development actions. So the question is uh, how to design useful program and strategies that support both returnees and local communities to which they return um, is uh, of high importance, but at the same time, it stands as a, a very huge challenge for policymakers. That's that's it. Thank you. So thank you, Ligela. Now, um, now the round is completed. I think the second round on the panel. Um, so at the moment, I'm not too optimistic for the last 25 minutes that we uh, can fix the problem with the technique. So I will go on uh, more or less uh, spontaneously at this point. Uh, looking back on the first question of the online survey, um, the question was um, if we can um, if, if um, regarding the current situation in the Western Balkan countries, if uh, return is a realistic perspective for young people. And the result was uh, one third uh, who voted uh, with yes, um, and two thirds uh, who vote with uh, no, it's not a real, uh, uh, realistic perspective. 
Uh, so this is more or less um, how it was to be expected. And this leads me as a kind of maybe provocative thesis for the last round um, on the panel. Um, I, I would like to formulate a thesis uh, which may come really a little bit provo provocative. Um, isn't it so that the main concern um, at time cannot be the question how to foster return migration or how to foster even circular migration? Um, main concern uh, nowadays is to create an environment which is attractive for potential returnees as, as, as the first step. I remember the lady yesterday from the company who was um, questioning the, uh, or asking the question of the hen and the egg, uh, which has to become at first. Um, so we have to talk about uh, an attractive environment for returnees uh, or vice versa is return of young people, the key maybe for improvement. So, um, or do we talk, talk about uh, more or less chase, uh, chasing one's own tail or just going around in circles, uh, which would be a very pessimistic perspective uh, at the end of the panel. So I would like to ask you for your comments uh, maybe three minutes uh, if you keep three minutes we can uh, maybe include uh, the audience um, in a, uh, by the end of the panel again so please maybe let's keep the order so Birgit I'd ask you to start um, well I mean that's really the central question of the whole conference I think and uh, yeah, it was well uh, already addressed in this first uh, panel on Wednesday without really finding answers. And um, I, maybe this just reflects that there cannot be an easy, easy answer because as we already discussed here in the panel, uh, emigration, migration decisions in general are highly individualistic and you cannot really prevent those decisions. You can rather really try to, to be transparent about opportunities and to be reflective about uh, constraint. Um, I think also Samir earlier mentioned the, 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 the or, or was it uh, Alida maybe, who, um, who mentioned the, the hypocrisy of the ruling elites, uh, which might make it difficult for young returnees who are really also early in their career and ambitious to find their place. So I think people have to be reflective about that. Um, equally important, of course, is, um, this was also already mentioned, uh, to don't um, uh, yeah, invent those dualisms that only the emigrants are those who are bright <laughs> and those who stay are somehow uh, backwards. Um, so that there must really be a really high level of, of, of reflexivity about those situations. And in terms of beneficial conditions, we have to keep in mind that this is also very individualistic, what you perceive as a beneficial condition, and it also changes over time. So for example, in our Bulgarian return study, we, we saw returnees who, um, when they started founding families in Bulgaria and their children reached um, educational age, they suddenly realized that the educational system in Bulgaria is not what they want for their children. And this can be a high trigger for re-emigrating. So this changes over time and there is no easy question about that. So thank you, Birgit. Um, and we can go on with uh, Monica from Bucharest. Please, Monica. Thank you, Professor Guder. I would like to stress the complexity of the whole issue about circular migration and return migration. Actually, circular migration is definitely beneficial. It is a beneficial process for labor markets and also for migrants themselves because of knowledge acquired during migration would create uh, human capital that would encourage further movement and the development at uh, origin and uh, sending and the uh, destination countries. Um, being beneficial, return migration as a part of circular migration should be encouraged by countries with a strong outflows of population because as we all know in our countries, in countries like Romania and Balkan countries, there is a severe 
um, shortage of labor in many sectors. It was already mentioned medical sector, but in other sectors with lower skill uh, uh, labor force such as construction, we also face labor shortages. Therefore, I would say that uh, return migration should be fostered and uh, should be considered policies for encouraging people to return, at least for uh, specific time periods. In this sense, at least in Romania, uh, we have analyzed the best practices in terms of policies developed for encouraging people to return. In our paper written by myself and my colleague, uh, Remus Angel, we emphasize three best practices that are put in place uh, with, uh, with success. The first one is related to medical doctors that are encouraged to return to Romania through various measures. And of course, the most successful one was to increase the salaries. And in the paper that are reported, uh, it is reported how this measure was implemented. We are not sure at this moment if the return migration will be possible, but at least the outflow of Romanian doctors abroad is at some point discouraged. Another example relates to entrepreneurship. Actually, uh, there are put in place some programs encouraging Romania living abroad to return to Romania for opening businesses and um, significant amounts of money are allotted for, for such projects, for such programs. For instance, uh, um, one um, project may be um, financed by up to 100,000 euro. In the previous program, uh, the projects were financed up to 30,000 euro and the program was successful and a significant number of uh, startup uh, were open and also a significant number of Romanian uh, living abroad uh, return. So I, I would just like to emphasize that in the end, decision makers are the one having the, the key for um, supporting these processes and um, for uh, controlling uh, economic imbalances related to labor market shortages and economic development. Thank you. We cannot hear Professor Gueller now. We cannot hear you. We should probably continue self-moderation. <laughs> yeah, so the issue of best practices was also raised by Antje Muller and I hope this provides a bit of more optimistic perspective of, on what can be done. Maybe Birgit can uh, take the moderator's place. Yeah. I can try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now we, uh, now we hear you, Professor. Ah, until okay, now. So you, you are very weak, uh, but now, I now we can hear you. Good, good. to listen to you. So the colleagues around me are very, very busy at the moment <laughs> and uh, just try to fix the problem. So we fixed it a little bit, I think, uh, so that we can um, finish the last round. Um, OK, uh, your, your statement is finished now. Or? Yes, mine is finished. Yeah, you should. Uh, yes, okay. pass it's hard to moderate <laughs> if you don't hear what people say. So <laughs> that's a, uh, the, the problem at the moment. So uh, please, Yelena, maybe you can end uh, something from your perspective, please. Thank you. Uh, I would like to be an optimist. Encouraging people to return is important. Actually, it would be best uh, and also uh, most difficult to reduce further immigration through systemic reforms. As was underlined, but it is also uh, too much to uh, not, it's not too much to repeat, it's crucial to establish the rule of law, high quality public services, the high standards of education and health care, and above all, the prevention of corruption and supporting independent institution, judiciary, 
and investigative journalism as democracy backbones. All Western Balkan countries need to significantly intensify European integration processes. At the same time, these changes would also help to better use their uh, knowledge and skills acquired abroad, returnees, of course. Uh, however, uh, as was uh, discussed during the conference, challenges are numerous, such as the lack of economic opportunities, and mismatch between the skills and labor markets needs, distrust is government institutions, or problems with uh, recognition of diplomas obtained abroad. Second point uh, I would uh, like to address is related to the temporary and seasonal work programs, which um, needs more attention uh, also at this conference. A vast majority of these workers are low qualified and do not understand well foreign languages. This is why it is necessary to work devotedly to combat fraud throughout the recruitment process and through the protect migrants workers against abuse and dependence on the will of agencies and employers. And, and employers. Therefore, it is needed to provide clear and accessible information for all participants in the migration process and to work on expanding the legal channels for international recruitment. And I would stress that uh, this is, uh, in this segment, the good cooperation between countries of origin and destination is crucial. Uh, and just one example on the possible measures that can significantly encourage both circular and return migration. It could be even beneficial to develop opportunities for portable social welfare benefits, uh, health care and life insurance. Uh, I addressed it also in the uh, background paper for this conference. And at the, at the end, I just shortly would like to refer to the lack of reliable and internationally comparable uh, migration data. It is a very difficult uh, uh, field, uh, more accurate, comprehensive and timely, as well as accessible migration data are needed. They are the basis without which neither research nor migration management can be properly advanced. In all Western Balkan countries, it is very important to establish a regular, updated, and synchronized statistical databases basis monitoring migration flows and its effects on the labor markets. And in order to achieve this, it is necessary to systematically approach the problem in both the origin and destination countries. So I hope I didn't take too much time. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Um, so I'd like to give Alida a voice, if you want. Sure. Um... I think we have opened up several different issues and they can be discussed separately or intertwined. But one is, uh, in my view, we shouldn't be discussing how to bring back people that have left the country only, but make countries attractive for everyone to come in. This is the key point. This is how it works in success successful cases. So once you have conditions in place, not only people that have left originally from the country will return, but they will also bring their networks. Once they bring their networks, they will bring their friends and the, these friends will bring their friends. And this is something that I've been discussing with, uh, with Samir separately from this conference, uh, this conference. But it's really like going back several stages of your networks in order to bring them back into, into the country. And once you do that, once you create such conditions, you don't have to worry about, you know, people from Bosnia, Croatia, uh, Montenegro, Serbia coming back. Everyone else will, will want to come, will, will want to arrive to the country. Second thing is, uh, if we discuss these matters, we also have to have in mind that uh, we really know very little about our diaspora. Who do we bring back? How do we reach out to these people? This is a fragmented area. I mean, all these people are all over the place that there are like several different associations uh, where they're anchored in, but not necessarily, you know, uh, uh, um, not necessarily all of them are there and not necessarily all of them are, you know, with, with the same scope of interest and the skills and qualifications and, and everything else. I mean, this is something that uh, we haven't even begun. So talking about these things, we have to um, sort of go back a little bit and try to try to map up our di diasporas in order to know who do we actually refer to? Who do we, who do we send these messages to? Um, and one important question that goes throughout the, as a thread throughout this conference is, is, is what happens with the government uh, or governments of the region? 
it's it's their liability it's their responsibility to actually fix these things that we keep on talking about corruption uh, political bad poisonous atmosphere toxic environment pollution all sorts of things um i i have to say that there are people um that are fully aware of this that are working within the government they're good people like everywhere else like in any other company private sector ngo but there seems to no, no, what we lack is this systemic sort of approach to it. There is no strategy. I haven't seen a single really comprehensive strategy that says this is a big picture. This is, you know, this is the region 10 years from now. If it doesn't go beyond their mandates, it doesn't happen. And once we have this big picture, we can discuss what, what, what are the sort of the milestones that we have to cross in order to get there. Um, and until this happens, until, again, I'm going to go back to the top-down approach, until we have a country that is a leader, in this case, that others can follow, we will not see a, a big sort of a buzz created around it, and it, it will really come down to these sporadic conferences, I'm afraid. I mean, Serbia has done, to some extent, something. Um, they have opened up some channels uh, with the UNDP. They have created several different platforms that seem to be very, very actually, um, seem to be attractive enough for, for people like digital nomads. But I think this has to be sort of multiplicated. It has to be replicated in, in other countries in order to have a full sense. And um, it's also, I, I think we should pull ourselves, uh, political elites with, of course, exceptions that I've already mentioned, that are currently re running the region are the same more or less the same people that have been running the region in the last several decades. So why would we expect them to change their heart overnight and start thinking about big, big visions and, and have become visionary overnight? I don't think this is, this is something uh, that is realistic. It, it is not realistic for the EU integrations. Inter it is not realistic necessarily for, for uh, the question of, on, on immigration. Um, and this is why we have to really start creating different groups like these um, in order to, to sort of uh, come more forcefully into, the, into this arena and start discussing this in a competent way. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to give the last voice from the panel to the youngest, to Samia, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I really don't know from where to start, but I will try to make three short points. So we have also some time for our comment from um, people who are patient um, with the technical parts and everything else um, and who followed our discussion. So first of all, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, there are a lot of cases of young people who apply for their second and third masters just because they don't have a job, because they are unemployed. And they can apply for foreign scholarships um, and that's how they sustain themselves. This is deeply disappointing and troubling. And this is not sustainable. Um, and in a lot of cases, those young people with second or third masters or even PhD, they go abroad, stay abroad in a lot of cases. And then you will hear Bosnian or generally politicians in the Western Balkans who say, well, yeah, you know, those people are good because they send money. Well, guess what? In a lot of cases, they take even their parents with them. And they do not send even that money anymore. So this is also th something that, that Balkans elites um, do not consider long term. And this is what Alita has been mentioning. You know, there is no this vision of the next 10 or 20 years, how to incorporate and how to use um, those young people and how to attract them back. Professor Gula, he was, he was mentioning a very good point about, you know, internships. Um, in our joint paper, I was during the last 13 weeks, I was, I was a part of a, of a young uh, team of 12 uh, young people from the Western Balkans who, who wrote a paper which is available on the, on the platform uh, about how to you know, solve this problem of brain drain, brain circulation, how to integrate people. One of our points is related to um, joint exchange programs of students and young professionals within the region. This would boost brain circulation within the region of young people, you know, young Serbs, Albanians, Macedonians, uh, Bosniaks, Croats, um, who will be able to, you know, study at different universities within the region, but not just study, also to go and do an internship or traineeship within the region. We do have successful companies where young people would be interested to gain uh, experience from. Um, make it, like, even within Bosnia, it's not possible to, like, study at different universities within Bosnia, within the same country. 
uh, it's not possible, you know, to go for an exchange. I cannot do the same within the region. And I think, um, and we think, the group of young people, um, one, of the, one of the recommendations is that the Western Balkan government should work together with the European Commission in establishing such programs. Uh, and I will conclude uh, with, um, I have also read the comment <clears throat> written by Azra Berbic, and I'm glad I'm not the only one. Unfortunately, I'm not the only one who mentioned, who noticed that the first panel, the ministerial panel, where politicians and ministers were speaking, didn't bring anything new, no solutions to the table. And this is something I think that we need to take care of. And this is something that we need to uh, focus on working with the politicians, trying to push them, um, for more sustainable, concrete solutions in order for um, our young people, young professionals, people with experience, knowledge, and very important contacts um, to come back or utilize their knowledge um, for, the, for the whole region. Thank you very much. So thank, thank you, Samir, uh, for your statement. Uh, I'm completely with you. So uh, when I remember the first day, Wednesday in the afternoon, um, we started with a trailer of the young people, of voices of young people, and they addressed very, very detailed and very concrete uh, problems uh, they are facing, substantial problems they are facing. Uh, and I was really, really disappointed by the answer uh, of the politicians, of most of the politicians, uh, because I heard nothing new. I heard the same things I heard 20, 25 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago. Uh, this was not a step forward um, is it, it was a step backwards uh, definitely and um, yesterday uh, if I remember right um, it was also a statement by one of the politicians uh, who said uh, my country is badly hit by immigration uh, my country is badly hit by immigration, but um, immigration is not an unavoidable natural disaster like an earthquake uh, or a cyclone or something um, else. Um, it's it's, it's uh, a consequence um, of bad governance. Uh, it's a consequence of the uh, business environment. It's a consequence of the social system, ed education system, all the things we talked about uh, yesterday and uh, today, um, as far as uh, I realized, uh, in our panel um, as well. So I think it's important just to wrap up in, in a minute. Um, economy is one point. Uh, we have to improve the economy uh, in these countries, in the Western Balkan countries, uh, like it is the case in other parts of the world, to stop emigration. At the moment, we have to deal with, we have to live with emigration because people on the Western Balkans are living from emigration. If we uh, look at remittances in some parts, mostly in the rural peripheral parts, remittances are the, 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 uh, the safety net for the population, especially for the growing elderly uh, population. That's a fact. But vice versa, remittances um, are good, uh, but remittances um, are critical in a point that they, it is also a, a citation from yesterday, it made people lazy. Um, it made people uh, not thinking about innovation. Uh, remittances uh, block uh, innovation. So uh, the, we have to keep this in mind. Uh, business environment is an important point, um, which was addressed today uh, several times, uh, which will be addressed in the next panel, maybe. Uh, but economy is not the only point. I think it has to be flanked by uh, improvement of the educational system. This was um, the voice of the youth uh, in, um, um, in the panel on Wednesday. Uh, it was uh, the red line yesterday. I think uh, education system uh, is of big, maybe is of the greatest importance uh, if you look uh, not that much on circular migration, but uh, on uh, permanent return migration. Um, especially in the long term. Uh, but to change, to improve the uh, educational system, we know it in Germany, it's in the European Union, the same. Um, this is a long-term story. So we cannot say, okay, we, let's change the educational system and we will gain effects uh, tomorrow or next week or the next year. This is um, in the long run. So we have to find uh, smaller solutions um, by now. And uh, one point is um, internship, for example. Um, uh, Antje Müller mentioned that. Uh, today in this panel, uh, another point could be for academics, for example, um, the thing uh, or the idea Ilya Gedeshi um, formulated 
uh, that uh, scholars, uh, academics from UK, from Germany, go to Western Balkan countries um, for some seminaries, for some lectures, uh, just for one week, maybe for one month or something like that. So, so this, this has to be part of the small solutions. Uh, and small solutions are um, good because we can uh, realize them, we can implement them um, uh, on, on, the, on the short run. So um, that's my thoughts. Um, by the end um, of a quite turbulent uh, panel. Uh, at the beginning, I uh, was talking about a challenging panel. Uh, I was thinking on the time, but not on the IT. We had some IT problems, uh, but this is part of the story if we make online conferences. Thank you for joining the panel. Um, um, thanks to the audience. Thanks to the panelists uh, for this uh, very good, uh, thoughtful uh, inputs. And um, I hope you will um, join us in the next panel and I wish Michael Martins, the moderator, uh, a good luck for that panel. See you soon. Goodbye. Thank you.